Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Faith and Prayer. Presented by Jesus and Mary on the 23rd of June 2013 in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session 4, part 1. So how are you this morning? Is, is 11 a bit early for everyone? No, it's okay. <laughs> it's maybe just early for us. <laughs> we did a lot of things before we got here today. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we try to fit too much in in our mornings, that's the problem. Yeah. So how are you this morning? Good? Yeah, very good. How did you find the talk yesterday? Yeah. yeah. So, um, for many of you, how did you find the, um, like, a lot of the times I feel like when I speak, I still am feeling from your soul confusion, and, um, and there's a lot of intellect at play, rather than just allowing yourself to feel about what is being said to you, that's generally the case. And many of your questions are driven by your fear-based, your, your intellect, through your fear. Um, so if you could think about, before you ask a question today, whether it's driven by a fear you have or whether it's just a thirst for truth or a thirst for knowledge, that'd be great. Because what we find generally is when we give uh, answers to questions that are based around fear, generally we get off topic and it's better if we can stay on topic today because there's still a lot of material to cover about prayer. So, and we'd really like to finish that off. Um, so if for anyone listening, this will be session four of the subject, Faith and Prayer. And we recommend to anybody who's listening on the internet to these particular presentations that they go through session one, two, three and four before they watch the last session, this session that we're doing today. This, of course, won't be the last session we do on these subjects, but we want to try to cover most of the main points today about prayer so that you feel pretty comfortable and confident about knowing what it's all about. Now, I know that many of you feel you know already what it's all about. Um, and and this is something that I continually struggle with. I was saying to, we were talking myself and Luli and Raj a few weeks ago about how many of my talks, I'm try, what I'm trying to do is use the English language to describe truths that the English language is not really suited for. And by the way, there is no language suited for it on earth either. All these truths have to be transmitted through the language of love. And that, as we started talking about last night. And the problem that we have generally is that most of us are still pretty distorted with our viewpoints of love. And so therefore, it's very difficult for us to understand what's really going on many, much of the time. So the more sensitive you become to what is involved with love, the, the easier you will find God's truth to understand from a soul perspective and actually implement from a soul perspective. And that's what we'd like to recommend to you to do. One of the beautiful things about prayer and this path is that um, you're, being, you're being delivered a lot of truth, hey? When Jesus gets up here and just speaks, he, he says a lot of truth. And the beautiful thing about truth is that it naturally confronts the error inside of us. And uh, what I notice sometimes is when the truth starts confronting the error... People go, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. And instead of just letting the error be confronted, feel that and then have your question. Um, so do you understand what Mary's saying? Let the error be confronted. Let the feeling that you have in that moment of confusion or whatever it is, that particular feeling, let that feeling be felt rather than trying to prevent the feeling by gaining more knowledge. Does that make sense to you? This is something that many of us do with God as well. We, we, we long for God's love. We feel a little bit of God's love. 
And then all of a sudden a, a, an emotion is confronted. And instead of allowing ourselves to have that emotional confrontation happen as a natural part of this process, we shut it down. We try to run away from it. We try to intellectually bamboozle ourselves out of it. Or we even try to intellectually manipulate ourselves out of it, actually. We have very strong desires, generally, to, to get out of truth, in many cases, and out of a state of humility. And I was thinking this morning, perhaps the best way to introduce the morning would be to talk with you a little about what the feelings are of different um, things that we have already discussed with you yesterday. So if we look at the four, five primary things that we discussed yesterday. Does anyone remember what they were? First one? Humility. Humility. Yep. Truth. Truth. And what we'll do here is I'm going to just change the order around a bit. Will, faith, and love. All right. So if you had to describe the feeling of humility, what, sorry, maybe, right. what, what would you describe it to be? If you had to describe the feeling. So maybe if we start with Kate and we come across to that. Soft. So it's soft, I agree. So when you say soft, it's soft and accepting. Yeah? Good. Bob? Huh? If we come here, who was that? Di, and then who was at the back? Jane. Jane. So if we go, we're going way back. I was going to say softening, but there's a bit of peace with that softening as well. So it's a sort of a peaceful feeling? Is when that I say really? peaceful, <laughs> when we say yeah. peaceful... Um, well, you don't feel... Um, that is well peaceful. Yeah. yeah, with the E. Is it with the E? Yeah. Oh. I often don't feel that peacefulness. So when I, at the moments when I'm feeling humble, and I can, that's the word I put to it, wow, I'm feeling humble at the moment. That's a really nice feeling. I feel soft, peaceful, and I'm not as noisy. I don't need to be as noisy when I'm being humble. Yeah, see, I feel that people who are humble can be very noisy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Tristan's like pretty humble. Tristan's guy. laughing at the and moment, so, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not about sure about the peaceful thing. Sometimes okay. when I surrender to a feeling, it doesn't feel that peaceful. When you're humble to your feelings, in particular, yeah. So that, that's uh, come time. Um, is openness in open? Humility. Very good. So it is definitely open. Yeah, open to own emotions. Can we say in particular? But it's also open to others' emotions as well. Yeah? That's a really key part of humility that I think often gets overlooked. And this is often why I see people um, getting quite self-centred when they're supposedly doing their emotional work, because I think it's all about me, it's all about my emotions, it's all about... And actually, I feel humility is actually this openness to what's inside of me. And when I'm really open to that, I, I'm open to what's happening around me. Can That's I give you an illustration of that, a practical illustration? Many of you have almost this rebellious feeling about your emotions and you almost feel like, I'm allowed to be emotional, it doesn't matter who's around me and what they feel about it. All right? Now, if we were truly humble, we wouldn't have that feeling. What we would feel is sensitive to the people around us and we would go, oh, that person's really uncomfortable with me feeling this terror in front of them, so I'm going to go away and feel this terror, uh, you know, when I'm away from them. That's what a humble person would do. And actually, it's not very humble to say, I'm having my emotions. That's, that's actually not... <laughs> that's angry. That's anger. <laughs> that's either I want to make a point or I'm angry about being shut down. Or, and it's, it's a very angry place, which is not humility anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other things, uh, Jane, if we go other back? To, to Jane. Um, surrender. So it's a surrendering process, yes, I agree. Yeah. When we say surrender, well, uh, if you can have the mic with you, Jane. What Just do back you, to Jane. What do you feel surrender is? like? Just... Allowing it, just allow it naturally to just flow into the emotion. I don't Good. know, it's just 
So it's an allowance process, is no, it? No, yeah, no resistance. So it's just the opposite to resistance. And the opposite to control, would you say? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So it's just let, yeah, letting go of control. Yeah. yeah, good. Um, if we just come forward to... I feel pretty broken when I'm feeling everything. It's just like I can't yeah. hold it and it's just flowing. Right, yeah. I, I actually wouldn't classify that as a humble pro place, though. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, if we go down the front here, and then if we come to Lawleen here. So there's a, a, an authentic palpability. Um, I definitely would say that it's authentic, right? In the sense that it, it's a place, authentic. It's a place where you're being very truthful about your own state. Mm. Does that make sense? So it's authentic and truthful. You could say that it's sincere. And can we call it real? And real. Right? These are the feelings associated with humility. Yeah, we will. I'm not sure if it's the same as surrender, but I would have said um, a willingness. Yes, uh, humility even hooks into this uh, under the emotion of desire. So it's not just willing. There's a difference between willing and actually desiring, isn't there? Willing is almost like a passive emotion, whereas desiring is a very active emotion. So when we're desirous, uh, I'll just put desirous, and willing, willing to me um, is not necessarily humble. I would say desirous is a humble state, just where you fully desire your true emotional condition. You tr fully desire it to be truthful and sincere. And that's very, very different than being willing because willing has this underlying uh, um, implication that you're being forced by something into well, a position. You, do it, you might be doing it just because you think it's the right thing to do. So you're forcing yourself intellectually yeah. under those circumstances. There's a, um, I feel a really distinct difference between when I'm having a cry and feeling like, oh, I wish this would be over. <laughs> you know, oh, this is hard, I've got to feel that's this. that's not humble. There's a big difference to that of just going, I'm in this, I'm not, I, however long it takes, I just want to feel this feeling because it's a part of what's in me yeah. and it's me expressing me right now, how I am. Yeah. So, and I feel like that's a really crucial difference between what is humble and what is trying to do emotional processing so I can get better at something, yeah. which is not really humble. Yeah. Well, then, you might have... um, is there an extension of desirous longing? Yeah, well, it, 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 is a, it is a longing to actually feel your real self. Yeah. So, so many of you still do not have a longing to feel your real self. You feel like you're getting forced into feeling your real self by the universe and God and the law of attraction and all these other things that come along into your life, but not really willing to feel your real self and, and because there's some resistance. But there's sort of like steps into it. There's the willingness. And to me, the willingness indicates now you've been forced for a long time and instead of being resistive, you're now willing. <laughs> but... But that's not the place of humility. Do the you really of, want it? Do you that's really want thing. it? <laughs> yeah. That's desire. And, and a, true, a person who's truly humble has a desire to feel everything, not just a willingness to feel everything. All right. yeah. if, if I would like to talk about longing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So when we're done. Um, when I finally get to the place of humility, <laughs> I feel a real deep sense of relief. It's like... God, I can just actually just be real and honest and just let it all be so, there. So would you say it's like you relax into it? Yeah, very much so. Instead of, instead of having fear about it or any other emotion about it, yeah. you're now relaxed into it. So the reality, like, let's say you had a feeling of shame and then if you had resistance initially, you'd be very scared of the emotion, you'd be trying to run away from it all the time. And then if you went into willingness, you, only, you, you don't run away anymore, but you're not trying to access your shame. And then when you go into desire, you're now accessing your shame. And a, as a result of this desire, because you're now receiving what you desire, there's also a, a relaxed feeling about the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, there's no more... Th there's, 
you get to that place where you just don't have to hold the walls up anymore. Yeah. You can just surrender and crash into it and just be there. Exactly. Yeah. No more effort. Yep. Sounds. Apart from the continuing feelings. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, just adding to what that conveyed, it's like letting go into what I would describe as the natural state. Yeah. Or the childlike state. The childlike state, yeah. yeah, letting go. But it's not a childlike tantrum, is it? No. Because that, that's not humble at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a childlike whatever it is, the true emotion, grief or whatever other emotion it is. You wanted to say, Ben, about... Oh, it was about longing, but perhaps once we're done, because... It yeah, because just... I just want to illustrate a few things about the feelings. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we go to Tim, and uh, we go to... Uh, Lindley, Lindley at the back. up the back there. If you like, keep your hand up, Lindley. For, yeah. Tim? Uh, yeah, just a, a soul opening to truth, for, no matter the source. Right, so you're not only open to your own emotions, can, you, can we say that you're open to God's truth? So it's not only, you're, not only you're open to your own truth, which could be very different to God's truth, eh? So not only are you open to your own truth, you're also open to God's truth. You're open to God's emotions too, actually. That's the magic thing, isn't it, about taking the first step of humility, truth and love. Once you do humility, you're already, you're already then receiving truth, receiving love. So it's yeah. not really a three-step process. It's all like integrated, really. It's not like you can do one and not experience the next one. Because God designed it that way that you just naturally start into the next one. Once you achieve... It's, it's like uh, when you did the way presentation. Once we master humility, that's it. God's created the rest. He brings the truth and the love to the equation. Yeah. 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 Now, why I'm... Uh, instead of... Uh, oh, we were up to... Lindley. Lindley. Uh, without judgment. Yes. Yeah, so I would say I would say when we use these negative terms like without something, without judgment, without resistance, without whatever, we're describing what it's not, but we're not describing what it is. So it's like an allowance then, if that's a possibility. Yes. Yeah, so we've already said allowance. And uh, what's the opposite to judgment? Acceptance. People have mentioned. Yeah. Well. Is that really the opposite to judgment? Acceptance is again a very passive emotion, is it not? So, so judgment is a very actively negative emotion, is it not? What would it look like if I was judging, 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 and then I did the opposite? How would What's I? What's the opposite? How would I respond? Not just accepting, but the opposite of it. Yeah. If we maybe come down the wheel. I would say forgiveness. Forgiveness is a part of it, but there's more... What's the feeling? So rather than we're using sort of a... The, what's the actual feeling, do you think, would be present? Um, Radio it, if we go across the... Lizzie? Sen, no. Sen. Yeah, Sandina. Sandina. <laughs> Compassion. Compassion is a very good answer, yes. Yeah. It's a completely... It's an active emotion, isn't it? Compassion. It's, it's not something that you're passive about anymore. It's something completely active, yeah? If we come down to joy. I was going to say love. Yes, it's but uh, we're going to describe love in more detail in a minute. Right, so. yes, but as a... <laughs> what, we're try, what, we're try, what we're aiming for is the feelings involved rather than just using some terms that you've heard many times before. We want the feelings involved. If we go straight back... Uh, uh, yep, uh, to Lizzie. To, sorry, yeah. Lizzie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Probably not a thing, but embrace. I just feel like to embrace. And embrace, the yeah, compassionate yeah. Embrace. embrace, isn't it? That's a very good description. Yes. And Glenda. And Glenda. Yeah. There's a discernment, so I can tell what is love and what is fear. Yes, but uh, I think w what we were aiming for was the opposite of judgment, and it, really the opposite of judgment is like a compassionate embrace. If we go for that as our, as our description, I think that's a pretty good description. So, compassion. Now, can you see that, um, rather than uh, ask more about it, there's a lot more we could say, but rather than ask more about it, can you see that many of you, when you go to speak truth with another person, you're not in that state? Can you see that? 
You're not in a humble state. You're not in that state. You're in a completely different state. Often you're angry, resistive. You're going to tell them off. You're going to give them what for. You're going to make them feel worse about themselves. You want to make them feel worse about themselves or you want to pull them down or you want to you know, defend yourself or whatever it is, but none of that is that state. All right? So can you see that when you go to speak the truth, many of you are not in a state of humility and if that's the case, how can you be in a state of truth? Because remember, humility is the doorway to truth. So if, you, if you're not being this before you speak the truth, then you're not in a state of truth. It's quite simple. Can you see that? Yeah. In order to receive the truth on a certain matter, you must be humble. So when you go to then share that truth with someone else, you'll do it from a state of humility. And this is where I feel like... A lot of people here, especially Jesus, speak a lot of truth and they go, yeah, I get it. I'm going out there into the world with it and I'm going to tell everyone. But unless you've had a soul-based process of receiving that truth, you're going to be doing it from, from another emotional place, the one that isn't humble. Mm. Whereas if you achieve humility and receive the truth into your soul, whenever you deliver that same truth, you'll do it from a place of humility. Okay, so, so rather than spending more time on the subject of humility, because we want to spend more time on that the next uh, time we get together with you, what we're going to do is ask you now, what are the, the feelings of truth? If we go to Jenny. You can choose, baby. Yep. Oh, I'll choose. I'm listening. Yep, and... To Jen at the back there after Jen here, Jen there. Yep. There's a sense of clarity. So clarity? Like yep. the fog lifts. Sorry? Like the fog lifts. There's a sense of clarity. Like the fog lifts. Yep, yep. So clarity, that's a good description. And Jen yes. at the can back. I, can I say, though, just about clarity, sorry, um, you can be really clear on a falsehood too. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> So I, I know many people who feel very clear and they feel like they've got a lot of clarity but they're speaking completely everything that's false. So I don't know whether that's a description of the emotion of truth. Remember here we're talking about truth. When, what are we saying? It's not... We're talking about the absolute truth of the universe, aren't we? Divine truth. So how does that feel? So that's are you talking asking. about how does it feel when we have truth? Or when we give truth or when we receive truth? Oh, and when we acknowledge truth and all those things. How does that feel? Because <laughs> that's what I was going to add to Jen. Sometimes when I receive truth, it feels like my whole world just went like that. <laughs> but I do feel when I receive truth, I have clarity about an issue. So maybe we should just leave that alone. <laughs> yeah, I, I see many people who have clarity who have no truth at all, so... I don't feel that's a great way of determining whether you've just received some truth. Yeah. So, Jen, there was the other Jen at yeah, the back. Jen, yeah. and then uh, we'll... It would feel soft because you'd be feeling soft. You'd be expressing the truth to someone else softly because you're in a space of humility. Yeah, See, I don't I know don't... about that either because I have in the past and also in the first century frequently uh, said things like, you know, the, the Sadducees and Pharisees were hypocrites, offspring of vipers. I wouldn't call that a very uh, soft <laughs> statement. I, I said that they were like whitewashed graves full of dead men's bones. I actually said that. So I, I don't know if that's very soft. Do you feel uh, soft? He's also told me at times that I'm just being bitchy. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> oh, well, I was just thinking about when you... You know, being loving to somebody, not on the other side. So there's there's two sides to it, isn't there? You know, when you're you're receiving a truth um, about yourself that um, is negative. Let let me ask you this question: Does truth, does God's truth compromise? No, never. No. Right. So so if we talked about truth, it the feeling is it never compromises. Now, the average person on this planet would tell you that you have to compromise. 
And in fact, they say that the only way to negotiate any settlement for any particular deal is you have to compromise. Well, that's love also, sacrifice and compromise. That's a widely held belief, isn't mm. it? And that's the only way you can have a relationship, is to have compromise. Whereas I would say, if you compromise, you're now not in truth. And in fact, if you compromise, there's two people now not in truth, probably, most of the time. And you're never going to have any proper resolution of any problem while two people are compromising. You ha have to actually work out what is the truth in order to know what to do. So, so if we arrange for some kind of legal transfer, for example, of a document, you know, a legal document that is about a transfer of a property or something like that, if one or the other compromises, then already one or the other is not in truth because they're not saying what they want and they're not firmly standing by what they want, right? So already they're not in truth. So I would say that, yeah, definitely, truth never compromises, mm. right? Now, that means that God's truth, if we, and here we're talking about God's truth, God's absolute truth. I'm, I'm stating that your truth will have to move frequently. <laughs> in other words... We have to allow ourselves to realise there's a very big difference between our own truth and God's truth. Our own truth will need to compromise because we're out of because often what we believe is truth is false, and so we will need to at some point let our truth go in order to accept God's truth. But God's truth never compromises, ever. God has never ever compromised with me or with you on any, any single point. Right? It's very important to understand that. God's truth is like a line in the sand. And God will not step over it or allow you to step over it. Right? Now, many of you don't like that. You don't want there to be a line in the sand. You want it to be a very blurred, a large area of grey. <laughs> Shall we say? <laughs> Plead special circumstances. So, what, My case is special though. Could we just move this way? What we have is... <laughs> right? And instead of you making a choice to be in one or the other, you want to be anywhere in between. In there. In the shades of grey. <laughs> Right. Now, you, many of you believe that's love. A person who allows you to remain in the shades of grey. But God loves completely and God never allows you to remain in shades of grey. There are consequences to a person sitting on the fence, as the saying goes. Right. So that's interesting, isn't it? So let's get back to how truth feels. It never compromises. What else might you say about it? So um, there's a, a willingness and a courage to expose a fact, regardless of whatever the response might be. I would call that humility. Oh. Would you call that humility? No, I think it's an aspect of truth. But, but the problem is, for many of us, is... We go, I need to be courageous. I need to stand up for truth. And then you stand up for truth while you compromise love, many of you. Like many of you, put yourself in positions where you're constantly compromising love and, then, and you call it sharing the truth with others. Now, to me, sharing the truth with others should only be done under two circumstances ethically. One is when somebody else has asked you to share it with them. And two, if you personally are affected and you cannot avoid being affected by the interaction. So, so for example, if I was sitting with Mary and Mary says a whole heap of things to me that I, that I feel are untrue, I'll say, well, do you want to know the truth? <laughs> and if Mary says, no, I don't, then I can only make one other choice and that is to stay or to leave. That's the only choice I can make, if I loved. Right? So truth does not force itself on somebody else. So, 
can I ask a question? Um, so what if it was a situation like recently I have um, declared an, an erroneous act that I did with my insurance company? You what, sorry? I, I declared a truth about an erroneous act I did with my insurance company. So you, declare, you told your insurance company that, you, that something you did in the past yes. was wrong? Yes. Yes? And? And, and? and so that's where I came to the point of, like, it took willingness and courage for me to do that. I agree. Regardless of what um, the response was going to be. I agree. That, and that is certainly a part of truth. Mm. Right? So you, certainly, this is what I said. I never said it wasn't. I was just saying mm. that you've got to be careful that you're not forcing it, that it's actually something that is willingly desired on the other part. Now, your insurance company has actually said in writing that they want you to do that, <laughs> right? They have in every contract that you have to openly declare everything. So naturally, you would do it because they desire that to happen. And, and it's up to you to, through ethics, to declare it. So it's definitely required. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But they wanted it. Mm. All right. So do you. Sorry, Ben. Sorry. Um, if we go, Igor, is there? Yeah. Um, when you first hear truth, it might be challenging, but then sense of relief must come after that. Yeah, um, see, what we're trying to do, isn't it, is we're trying to describe the feelings associated with God's truth. Freedom. Right, so yes, freedom is a definite sense of all truth creates freedom. The truth will set you free. And so it creates a feeling of freedom in the end, but only in the end. Initially, you might be severely challenged and feel like it's a restriction until you've worked your way through the emotional aspects of it. But it definitely, in the end, creates a sense of freedom. And in fact, many of you have yet to experience that. You see, many of you are still quite afraid about sharing the truth with your partners, with your children, with your friends, with your family, with the world in general. And as a result of that particular fear that you have, you never feel free. You're always under some kind of constraint. So you've never experienced really the sense of freedom that comes from sharing the truth. From a, the feeling of truth, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Havana had a hand Havana? up. Hey, I was just going to ask, um, just with what you were saying before about um, your example with Mary, um, like if Mary was just saying whatever she was saying and you felt it was untrue and do you want to know the truth? What happens, like, if I don't... Just say I'm talking with Justin about something and I feel what he's saying is completely untrue but I'm not totally certain about what I feel? Would I just say, do you want to know what I feel instead of do you want to know the truth? Yeah, of course. Yeah? OK. Yeah. All right. So, But, but the fact that you've got to ask that question... Ask what question? The question you just asked. Um, then you don't see a problem with that, having to ask that question. Surely that would be a natural thing you'd say to your partner. Yeah, we have a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> oh, what I'm getting at is I, even having to say that to your partner is a fear-based statement, which means that you feel that your partner is not accepting of your own position. Yeah. That's, Does that make sense? Yeah. Which is an indication of, uh, of a fact there is a deeper problem yeah. rather than... So, so to me, I would naturally share with Mary everything about how I feel, yeah. right? Assuming that she would want to know. And if she doesn't want to know, then I have to question why I'm in a partnership with her. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Because obviously if the other person doesn't want to know anything about me... And how I feel, even if how I feel is wrong, yeah. then obviously there's not much openness between the two of us mm. and we won't be able to move forward on hardly any issues under those circumstances. Yeah. So it's probably, if you imagine I was a stranger <laughs> in that analogy, that 
um, Jesus was giving earlier about if I blurb a blurb a blurb on about something and I, we didn't know each other, we weren't in a, an intimate relationship, then he, he might say, well, do you want to hear my thoughts on that or do you want to know the truth about that? Yeah. There's a big but, difference too between my feelings about it and the truth about it. Oh, yeah, and that's why I was asking the question because, yeah... yeah. Um, but many times, yeah. many of you believe your feelings about it are the truth. Yeah. yeah. And most of the time they're not, actually. Yeah. They're not God's truth. They're only your opinions. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel that um, also we need to be careful of saying, right, okay, now I just have to ask people. And the, really the, the point that you're trying to make is really about an emotional state, isn't it? If you wander around having the feeling that people should listen and you know God's truth and that's yep. it, and then you just go, so do you want to know the truth about that? <laughs> you really missed the, the lesson of love. Or yeah. the not, not only of that, you humility. are also <laughs> out of harmony with truth and humility yep. right in that place. So you're nowhere near truth mm. in that place, actually. Yep. And, and many people who believe they are in truth in that place are way, way away from truth. You're misrepresenting the truth. Yeah. And that's why I get a little bit um, funny when we start to talk about what's the qualities of truth and humility because to me, you can't actually speak truth unless you're already humble. Somebody asked me why I didn't come up here yesterday to talk and I had all this, I was so passionate about the topic and it was because I felt like I'm not really that humble today and so I can't really speak any truth about this topic even though I feel like I've got experience with it at the moment because I... Just that very fact alone would mean that I wouldn't be able to deliver the truth with love to you. It, it, regardless of what emotion I was denying, without really like feeling myself how I would feel in front of a crowd, then I knew I couldn't deliver truth. Well, I don't feel very humble at all, so I don't think <laughs> I should say much at all, really. Well, this is where it's great, because you learn to self-reflect more yeah. and open your mouth less. Yep. And that's not a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> you see, this is the problem is that many times we hear the truth, we have a recognition of it to a degree in our soul in a sense that we feel that it's probably highly likely true. We feel quite keen about it, you know, we might have a desire for it. And then we want to go around forcing it upon other people without actually accepting it in our own soul first. Now, that, that's pretty out of hand. That's called hypocrisy. There's a word for it, hypocrisy. To be truly unhypocritical, what we need to do is feel the truth of it first. And we should only really be sharing divine truth with others that we ourselves have felt first as truth. And to do that, you would already, as Mary's been pointing out, be in a humble place when you share that particular truth. So whenever you're not in a humble place sharing a particular truth, that means that this truth isn't in you yet. It's just an intellectual concept and you've got a lot of emotional baggage yet to release before it becomes a soul-based feeling. And then I guess we're just creating more pain for ourselves and for others that Dead we right. then have to work through later. Dead right. Many of you ask us the question, why is it that whenever I share the truth with others, they always react badly? You know, they always get angry, resistive, all that, you know. It's all hard to share the truth. Well, it's hard to under those circumstances because it's your emotions that's creating that particular response. Like, I very rarely have people doing that with me. In the situation where I'm sharing truth with them, it's very rare for people to attack me or do anything towards me. They might go away, think about what I just said, and then want to attack me. That frequently happens. But in the situation, it's very rare for people to feel attacking towards me because they can feel my love for them while I'm sharing the truth. They can feel that I'm in a humble place while I'm sharing the truth. I'm not trying to attack them or denigrate them or pull them down. And yet I can say some pretty straight things, as many of you know, Right? And yet still ha not have the feeling that I'm trying to judge you or pull you down or tear you apart or any of these other kinds of feelings that we often get very resistive to. That's why people listen. If people are not listening to you about truth, that's why people are not listening because you're not in that state, in the hum humble state that is required to, in order to share truth with others. Also, I would suggest the truth is not in your heart yet. Because the first truth really that needs to be in our heart is the truth about love. Right? 
And the truth is that love never forces itself upon another, just like truth never forces itself upon another. Right? Love is open to the will of the individual. It, it, it acknowledges and not only acknowledges, supports the will of the individual. Right? So that's a primary truth about love. And if we were in a state of truth, we would know that. We would feel that. So we'd never be able to attack somebody, even if they were out of harmony with truth themselves. We'd never be able to attack them constantly. We would be firm. We would never compromise. So when Mary's being a bitch, I, I say, yeah, you're being a bitch now. It never really happens anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over that now. Are you sure? <laughs> I reckon you're pretty much over it. I haven't, I haven't felt you've been a bitch for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Thank but the, you guys. the reality is that like a spade is a spade <laughs> and and we and and I, I i don't use the term bitch in a judgmental way by the way i just say if we define being, what to me being a bitch is being someone who's angry aggressive attacking belittling Bit condescending manipulative, manipulative yeah. um then i would say yes mary you're being all of those things in that particular place, you know, whatever, whatever she was doing at the time. And I rarely feel those emotions from Mary now. Right? But um, I also used to feel this emotion of she wants to be that. <laughs> That's what she wanted to be. And, and, that, and then I say, yeah, and you want to be like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> so a person who's in truth would never compromise, but at the same time, I also would never tried to force Mary to be something different. I'm just saying, look, babe, you want to be like that? I can't be with you. Right? I'm not trying to control your behaviour, but I'm telling you, I'm going to leave. Right? Or you're going to have to leave if I own the house. <laughs> um, other, otherwise, we're, we're never going to get forward on these issues. Right? We need to determine whether you want to stay that way or not. And unfortunately, many of us do want to stay those ways and we don't want to yeah. compromise on those ways. And I was just saying to you last night after this talk, actually, that I feel like it's very little understood the power of someone just calling a spade a spade. Like, for me, when, when I met AJ, I was a pretty... You know how yesterday he was talking about... God feels your soul, and when there's flowing emotions, God feels it more, and then there's hard ones that are like a rock, you know, and it's hard for anyone to feel them. I felt like when I met him, I was the rock. Everything was the rock, you know, and I was, I, this, I was in this place of wanting control and wanting power because of a lot of stuck emotions that I didn't want to feel, and it took someone being very direct with me over a period of years for me to <laughs> loosen up. <laughs> um, and I feel like very often this is the power of truth, is that it doesn't hint, it doesn't really, you know, leave it up to you to join the dots. It just says it without expectation or demand or a desire to judge. It just says, here it is. Do with it what you will. And that is really what you did with me, wasn't it? Mm. Here it is. From the, from the second or third email, here it is. And I would read the email, go away for two days, <laughs> go, no, nope, that's it. I'm nothing, nothing to do with this man. I'm not, no, 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 no. It's all crazy. And then I have to sit back down and go, he's right. Damn it. <laughs> you know, and that's the power of truth. But that, but that required humility on Mary's part because it, she could have said, he's just a bastard and I'm not going to listen to him again. Even though she, if she really felt that I was right, she could have done that just for her own, you know, from, from her own avoid, emotional position yeah. to avoid a lot of things. And she chose to not do that. So I remember the first email I received from Mary. It was just sort of two lines and it said, um, I hear that you think I'm your soulmate. Please tell me what this is about, Mary. <laughs> and that was direct. And I, I thought, thought about that for a bit <laughs> and I said, OK, I'll tell her what it's about. So... Ten pages later. <laughs> I asked. <laughs> she asked, right? So I waited for her will to be engaged before I told her. She told me, whether she meant it or not at the time, it didn't matter, <laughs> but she told me she wanted to uh, receive 
what, what I thought it was about, and so I told her what, I was, what it was about um, in terms of what I felt. And uh, everyone who was with me at the time read my letter afterwards, I, after I sent it, they said, and you sent that? <laughs> What'd you send that for? She's going to run 100 miles with that. <laughs> right? And, and the reality is, she, she did initially have a reaction, but the soul who is humble or who seeks truth is attractive to truth. Right? Well, that was one of the things I wanted to add to the list, that I feel that truth is very attractive. I, in a spiritual sense, um, it builds upon itself and it attracts truth to it, but also it's quite attractive to... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to say that to him, truth sexy. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that particularly the other half of your soul will feel that. <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> so just leave it like that, shall we? But the other half of your soul will feel very like attracted to you sharing the real truth with them about how you feel, how you feel about them, how you feel about God, everything. Even if it's like the end of the world, sometimes we've had the end of the world discussion where I fess up and go, this is how I feel, la la la. And then it's just so, it's like, oh, I let that go. Now we're totally attracted to each other. So sometimes Mary has gotten really stressed about sharing the truth with me. And, and, and because she's worried that at some point I'll, I'll hear it all and go, now that's all too much now. <laughs> now I really can't and, love and you. And I go, oh, that's really beautiful, babe, thanks. <laughs> you know, and she goes, what, what? <laughs> because most people are used to doing that, aren't they? When it comes to sharing truth, you're used to um, being in this place where you feel like truth is attacking or you feel like it's denigrating. And as a result, you, you sort of expect the other person so when you get into a state of personal repentance, sometimes you expect the other person to be like abusive or, or attacking towards you or even no, not like wanting to see you anymore, you know, feeling ashamed of you or any of those kind of emotions. But the reality is, if we share the truth with others, it's highly unlikely that that will be the long-term outcome of the sharing of truth. The long-term outcome is usually always quite good. And I feel strongly on this issue of the other half of your soul, when you speak the truth to the other half of your soul, it is very attractive to them. Even if it's incredibly confronting, even if they do run... Like when we met... What's that? I don't know if it's a sports thing you do at school or whatever. But um, where you, you do... It's kind of like relays. You, you touch a point, then you run in one direction, and then you run back and you touch a point again. Does anyone, did anyone do that in training at school? That's kind of what it was like in our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have some truth. I'd run 100 miles in the other direction, and then I'd go, oh, I'm so I attracted to that. <laughs> I come back again. And, and over time, obviously, less running, more closeness. But this is... I don't know how it would have worked out if you had it from the outset gone... I don't want to scare her too much. I don't want to... I'll water this down and I'll make it smaller and, and I'll sacrifice who I am in order to make her more comfortable. I don't actually believe that we would have... Well, we certainly wouldn't have the kind of relationship we have now, mm. but I don't even know if I would have been as attracted to you as I, as I am, mm. as I was, even though I was... It was confronting so many injuries inside of me. It was still very compelling, this feeling of... Some, the other half of me speaking the truth. And I still had to process things emotionally, of course. So every time Mary went away, I had some feelings that I had to feel, and I went through those feelings. I was saying to Mary, we were driving home last night from the thing last night, and one time that Mary just totally outright rejected me, really firmly, and I cried for eight hours a day for nearly 12 weeks. Yeah, Tristan, my son, was living with me at the time and he'll testify that that was <laughs> pretty much the case. <laughs> and then I went through the end of the processing and I realised it was a lot about how I felt about myself, actually, that Mary was just reflecting at me. And once I processed my way through those emotions, which I'd been resisting for a lot of those 12 weeks, um, it, uh, I came out of it in this state of freedom and, uh, and felt, yeah, interesting. She's going to call me in a couple of days. So for nearly, for, for, for nearly three months, I didn't hear from her at all. And, uh, and then I felt like, she, she's probably going to call me in the next few days. And sure enough, the next morning she called me. Yeah. And we re-established communication again after that. 
So, so the truth has this powerful effect on both parties. When you acknowledge the truth, you will find that you will easily get into emotion when you acknowledge the truth. So I had to acknowledge the truth at the time. The reason why I had that emotional experience was I had to acknowledge the truth at the time, and it was the truth at the time, that the other half of my soul just hated me, did not want to be with me, and, and felt like she would rather anybody else but me. And I, once I acknowledged that inside of myself, I went through the process emotionally of feeling a lot of those emotions and in the end released a lot of very negative emotions about myself in the process and came out of that and then ironically within the next few days I knew, uh, well, the, uh, as soon as I came out of that emotion I think I even said to Tristan uh, I think she'll kill me in the next couple of days but that's the way I felt uh, she'll kill me in the next couple of days kill, call not call kill me, call me, <laughs> kill me. Never possible got... <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, she, she will call me in the next couple of days and, uh, and sure enough, Mary did. And that's happened a number of times, actually, where Mary's felt really, really stressed about something that's been said or, uh, or at the time you're even just really stressed. You keep surfing back. <laughs> <laughs> she worried, you worried about everyone. And you, you're, yeah, you... I was... You were sort of like um, always making the step away, coming back. And it is like that, you know. In the end, the truth is attractive to a person who's sincere. And surely, you know, you would like whoever you're going to be with to be sincere. So, of course, it's going to be attractive, right? So, it's very important to understand that. Yeah. And it's... Yeah. Go on. No, I just... I feel... I, I'm still working through my shame about a lot of those, th those early times. But I've, as I was saying to Jesus last night, like that was such a gift that he gave to our soul to be humble in, the, in those moments, in those months, because it really did open something for me and, mm. I, and I was brought back and, and my growth has been slower, um, but it's assisted by the other half of you and I feel that a lot of people don't really feel that this is one soul and my humility is a gift not only to me and my relationship with God, but to the other half of me. Mm. And even when it seems like totally hopeless, I think before, that, before those three months, I had sat down with Jesus and said, I just don't, it's not here. I don't feel anything for you. I'm not attracted to you. Lie, lie to myself. But that's really how frightened I was. It was like zero. I couldn't, I just couldn't feel anything. And, you know, he could have walked away then and judged me or, you know, wanted to never have anything to do with me, but he was just humble. And that gave so much to our soul, so much more opportunity and so much more growth. Mm. Mm. But we're getting a bit off cho yeah. topic because we want to talk about the, the feelings of truth. So what are those feelings of truth? Tristan, please. Um, it's, uh, the only word I can think about it is uh, illuminating. Basically, it c connects totally with all other absolute truth you already know. So, um, how can we describe that in a few words? Um, it, well, it's that building on itself thing it, that I it said before. It builds and... and illuminates. I feel like it illuminates the error as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it just shows up everything. Sh shines a light in there. Yeah. Um, I know it's not the right word, I'm just trying to find a word, but it's constructive in the sense... Um, how do you... What's the word when everything is joins together? Co cohesive. Um. Synergy, yeah. Consolidatory. <laughs> resonates, yeah. I know a lot of people where error resonates with them much more than truth does. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to describe, but I, I must agree with what Tristan's saying. It's just, it, it, it builds on previous things that you have already established as soul-based truths. So it never has any disharmony with it, but it's like, a, it's like a, a, a construction, you know, where you have a foundation and then you have walls and you have a roof. Everything fits together in a cohesive whole, and even when there's a bit missing, once you get the bit that's missing and put it in place, everything fits in together again. Even on a very minute scale. Like yeah. Even in the tiniest Right down bit. to the tiniest detail. To the biggest. It's it just, reminds yeah. me of like muscle fibres and different fibres in your body, the way they all just link together in this beautiful, yeah. I'm not sure how to describe that as a word though. Um, 
Sorry? Consolidates, yeah, I thought about that word, but it's not really... <laughs> what about builds upon itself? Can we have three words? Yeah, builds upon itself might uh, be the best. I liked illuminating too, because it shines a light on a lot of things, doesn't it? Not quite yep. the uh, If we go up to Josh at the back there, eh? I was just going to mention that aspect of truth um, where it feels like a powerful wall of love, I guess. Yeah. In, in, an, in the sense of like you're having an aura and it just feels like a wall of. So it has power, power strength. and strength and it motivates to action. See, many, this is the reason why many of you have not acted upon the truths that you've received. is because you've only received them in your mind. And when you only receive something in your mind, it doesn't motivate you to action. Right? It's only when it hits your soul that it truly motivates you into action. In fact, action is unavoidable when it hits your soul. You, you can't help but do it. Like, you can't... You're not always trying to get away from it either. You love it. You know, you love it. And you can't help but do it. You're drawn into doing it. But let's uh, leave that there. What I'm trying to illustrate here, how there is a series of things or qualities that are feelings associated with truth. Just like there were a, se a, a series of thing things or qualities that, or attributes, you could say, of feelings that associated with humility. Now, when it comes to will, what does that feel like? So, is the question, what does our will feel like? What does our will feel like? Deirdre, you there? Yeah. <laughs> will said me. Feels like me. Uh, will said it feels like will. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> feels like it. Uh, this might be wrong, but determination, like it's like, uh, well, that might be more my stubbornness, but... <laughs> In Determination, the wrong way. <laughs> yes. Can I call it, um, if we can call it. Like unyielding, probably more. Uh, no, that's not wrong. That's wrong. Definite, you say? It's a desirous determination. It's not something that you determine because you have to or because you feel forced into it. It's something that you feel like doing with your whole heart. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. If we go Jane, Will, and then Tristan. Tristan first, because Mike's there first. Um, it flows like water. It, uh, it doesn't stay in one, one place. All right, so it, it's flowing. So it's not like... Not stagnant. Not stagnant. Yeah. But I don't like using the knots. Right. Um, Jane? Jane? It feels um, strong. Like, um, it's firm and strong. Firm, yes. yeah, I think that's the word. Firm and strong. Yeah. And and can you say that it's like, it's right. It just feels really bright. Yeah. yeah. Bright, bright. No, she said right. Right. Sorry. Bright. <laughs> right. I, but bright's a good one too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I like bright. Yeah. So right, you said. Um, In what way do you mean right? Just so sure. It's the surety of it. It feels yeah, that's really sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And where do I go next? Oh, Will down the yeah. front here was, and then over to Igor on the side. I've been trying to think of the words to use, but it feels like waking up or stretching. Like, right. um, and like when Christian said, water flowing, it's like it starts with a droplet, and then there's like there's two droplets flowing, and then there's three droplets flowing, and it's just it builds on itself. So it grows? Yeah, it feels like a growing, passionate desire. Yeah. Um, Igor was next. Um, it feels alive. It feels alive. alive, yeah, not dead. Yeah, alive. Yeah. Uh, if you want to go yeah. to... Yeah. Who's that? Um, hey, Wayne. Yeah, Wayne. Yeah. And Control. Else? Control. 
Yeah, I don't think so, Wayne. Um, I, I sort of feel like when you use your will, you don't necessarily want control. Uh, in fact, you, you have a certain, if it's an emotional exercise of your will, if it's intellectual, yes, you often do want control. But control is often driven by fears and not by your will. So um, I feel this is where a lot of people become a bit confused with their will. They sort of, um, they develop control of their life using their will, but a lot of times it's in protection of a lot of quite negative emotions. Yeah. Sometimes it feels to me like when I embrace my will, I'm, it's an expression of myself that I, of what I want to do. And so sometimes it feels like I'm taking more um, and I'm just wondering if maybe that's where your comment came from. It's not control over myself, but it, and it's not responsibility of myself, but it's more like expressing myself in a purposeful way when I haven't before. So could we say emotional expression of your true self? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Raylan, you had a bit similar? And um, do you want to go to Cecily at the Cecily back? Cecily, yeah. and then who's on, in orange in front? Yeah. yeah. It's empowering. It's empowering in terms of what way do you feel, Cess? I think what you said about emotional expression is I feel some connection to that expression of it. Um, I can realise... Can, can, can I say, and I think the feeling that you're trying to aim for here is um, a feeling that when you engage your will, it sort of... It's very much like truth in that it builds upon itself. It's like a construction. And, and as a result, it always finishes up affirming your own desires back to yourself. It, it, it has this thing of in, empowering you to follow a certain path because you, does it, because you want to. But each step you take on the path gathers more power and momentum. Does that make sense? Sure. If, it's, if your will is being exercised in harmony with love, that's what happens. You, each step on the path leads you to a greater expression of your will and in the direction that you need to express it. So, for example, if you were truly passionate about sharing divine truth with others, you might start by sharing it with your next-door neighbour or your friend. And then, as, thing, as you deal with certain emotions, you will attract bigger and bigger groups wanting you to share divine truth with others. Right? You won't have to force that. You won't have to control that. You won't have to organise it even. It will, it will be a naturally occurring thing if you really had a desire to use your will in that direction. Right? So, so it would be something that would be growing. If your will is in harmony with love, it would naturally grow without you making it grow. If it's not in harmony with love, then it won't naturally grow. Or if your will is not being expressed clearly, it will not naturally grow. Right, so true expression of your will is very empowering. It's supportive of your prior choices and decisions. Yeah. If we come to Rob uh, on this side and yeah. Raylene this side. Yeah. Next. Okay. Right. To me, it's uh, like a feeling of expansion and joy. It brings joy with it. And it, yeah, I, I think I it shares that with truth too. There's this it does, feeling yes. of growth. Yep. No, I agree. I feel now we're talking about a lot of the effects rather than the feelings of it. And so I agree with all of the effects, but if we can focus more upon the feelings, that'd be great. The, what it feels like. If we, the lady in orange, I can't, I don't know. Yeah, oh, Rob first. So sorry, Rob, you got it in your mind. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's excitement and energy. It's very exciting, yeah, and full of energy, yep. Yeah. Exciting. And, and energetic. That energetic, that is, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, up the back. It's passionate. It is very passionate, yep. Well, let's, let's leave that one there. What are we noticing so far, though? We've discussed three of these qualities. What are we noticing so far? You can see how a lot of the feelings involved in them overlap. That is true. What else are we noticing? If it's in harmony with truth and in harmony with love, we notice that it always results in growth. It's all, they're growing emotions. They, they start off small and they end up bigger every single time. 
Right? And they support each other. Yeah. And they support each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Enter. And it, and it inspires others to grow as well. They inspire others. They don't attack others. They ins it inspires others. So it inspires others. It allows others to look at and see what's happening and then inspires them into some form of action generally. Now, we've discussed the emotions of faith over the last three times we've got together, so I'm not going to list the emotions of faith because that's something we've already discussed. Now, what, what's the point of this discussion so far, is the question. Any ideas what the point is? Right, if we go to Liz at the back and then down. Because a lot of these are integrated between all of them. They are. I think that's self-evident, though. Yep. So if we come down, you just, you just get your hand up. Yep. And then... Uh, Graham, no? Yeah, Graham. We'll come to Graham. Yeah. Feeling. They're all feelings. They're all emotions. Not intellectual. Not intellectual. Feeling. This is very important. Very important to understand. Many of you still do not get that really. That all of these things enter your soul. They're not things that can enter your head. All right? If they've entered your head without entering your soul, then often they're not in you know, the proper... Like as we pointed out with truth and humility, often you're telling the truth but not being humble. That's an indication that's entered your head, hasn't touched your soul yet. Does that make sense? And it's really when we express them from our soul that the power comes, that the supportiveness comes, that the inspiration comes. Yeah, it has to come from the soul and it has to have some kind of emotional content that's real. Mm -hmm. So who did I say? Graham. Maybe Graham. Yeah. So when we get out of our head, we can integrate it more into the feeling centre. Yes, so well... We don't even have to try to get it out of our head. This is where I'm leading to, actually. We, we, I've described a whole heap of emotions, and if you think about it, the majority of us still don't really know humility. If you describe humility as the list of emotions that we actually listed. If you think about it, the majority of us don't really, have never really felt truth. Because if you, if you list the group of emotions that we felt, that I've listed about truth, most of us probably haven't felt much many of those emotions with many subjects. So, so, for example, yesterday I brought up the issue of soulmates. I could say almost categorically that 95 to 98 percent of you in the audience currently have never felt the emotions of truth or humility related to soulmates. All right? And there must be a lot of reasons why, and we can we can talk about them separately, but. But that, that's one area, because, because the majority are still not with our soulmates. It's patently, blatantly obvious that there must be something going on still. Does that make sense? Must be going, something going on still. And the reality is most of us are still not feeling our will. In fact, many of you even decided to move here without the true expression of your will. Right? So those of you who moved to here or, or, or to this region because we had previously moved to this region, many of you did not exercise your will in doing so. You only exercised it based upon a fear that you had or some other thing or, or an expectation that I would somehow drive your will. That, in fact, many of you actually wanted a guru. You wanted somebody to tell you what to do. Because you don't want to take responsibility for telling yourself what to do. It's not really working out, is it? It didn't work out very well, <laughs> right? Because we don't do that. We don't tell people what to do. We're only giving you teachings of truth to decide what to do with yourself. And we're not going to tell what to do with the rest of your life. And, that, that will, and God, by the way, will not either. Because God loves you. God wants you to choose through your will what to do for the rest of your life, right? So you, when you say people made decisions and moved, you don't mean that they didn't use their will because they did. You mean they didn't use a loving expression it of their It wasn't a will. loving expression yeah. of their will. Yeah. It was a fear-based expression of your will, right? And this is what I'm saying. Many of you have yet to engage your will without fear. Right? Remember yesterday we raised this issue, and this is an issue with faith, Remember, we, we raised the issue of fear 
And fear is really the error, right? So yesterday, if you think about our conversation, and this is where I'm leading to our conversation today, we are in a state of error often, and error is always the thing that creates the fear that we live in. All right? It's always the thing that creates the fear. If you think about it, many of us have only got faith in the error. We have faith in the error. Now, in having faith in the error, we take actions using our will to support our faith in the error. And then we start to think that the truth is error. (laughs) In fact, that's what drove a lot of our decision to do such a thing in the first place. And of course... Because we're not humble to how we feel, we actually only feel emotions that are actually errors, not true. So many of us have actually been processing emotions that are not actually emotions that you need to process. They're emotions that you want to process because you don't like the emotions you need to process. Does that make sense to you? You're processing emotions you like to process because you don't want to process the emotions you have to process in order to get closer to God. And so there's no humility in that. That's a choice exercised by your own heart and mind to go down a certain road because you don't want to go down another road. And God's always trying to drag you down this one. (laughs) And the law of attraction is always trying to drag you down that one. And all of God's laws, in fact, the law of cause and effect, and the law, all of God's laws of love are all trying to drag you down in that direction. But you're going, no, 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 no. I like my error, so I am only going to feel the things that agree with my current state, what I'm a, are going to allow. Now, the problem with that is that that is based on this problem, this feeling of fear. Now, where fear exists... Truth cannot really exist. The, the accurate expression of our will will never be, the joyful expression of our will will never be realised. We will never get into a humble condition. We will also not have faith in any truth. We will only have faith in the error itself. And we can't love. We won't receive love and we won't be able to give love. This is why many of you have heard me speak for four or five years but are still struggling receiving and giving love because you have faith in the error based position you see quite often myself and Mary have had discussions where Mary's saying oh it's this and oh it's that and she's intellectually worked out this and she's intellectually worked out that and she's done all this work and, and usually that happens over the course of a few hours and then she comes to me and says look I'd like to have a chat with you about something and I go, no worries, we sit down, we start talking, and I say, yeah, you've got it all wrong, darling, sorry. <laughs> because it's really quite simple. You're afraid. And you don't want to feel your fear. And because of that, everything you do after that is flawed. Now I just streamline. There's a problem? What am I afraid of? <laughs> don't even have to have the discussion. <laughs> and, then, and what Mary's found since doing that is that she gets into her fear a lot more readily, acknowledging every time that it's got to be a fear that's stopping the progress. I also um, really came to understand how much faith I had in error. And recognising that changed everything, really. Recognising how much I was faithful to what I believed would happen in the negative and that, how much that was impacting on my will, on my faith, on my desires. And maybe we need to give some examples. I um, can. Oh, I can give some examples from my own life and you can give some yep. examples from yours. Yeah. Okay. There was just a question over here. Do you want to no, take that No, I would like to. Yep. Sorry, sure. proceed. Yeah, yep. go. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You want me to go? You go. Um, well, I, I think, like, all through my life I've had memories about different events happening to me, right? So, so... Shortly after I was two years of age, I started having memories about having nails driven through my feet and my, and my wrists. And, um, and as you can imagine, for a two-year-old, um, that was pretty scary. And actually, my body responded and I had to have an operation. I had part of my bowel removed and everything because I had so much fear. 
And, and after a while, I learnt to shut it all down. Like I, I learnt by the time I was six, I got control of everything, of it all, and, and shut it all down. I never discussed it with anybody, of course, because I just thought, yeah, even when I was two, there was nothing I could say about it. Um, it was just feelings of nails being driven into me and stuff like that. But um, then as I, as I grew older, I, I started like really actively shutting it all down. Right? So I, I didn't want to feel it, so I had no humility. I didn't want to accept that it had happened to me, so I had no desire for the truth about it. I used my will to actively avoid it emotionally. Now, by the time I was 33, um, I started getting close to really having some major stresses in my life. And as a result of that, all of these memories started returning to me. And I could have, again, chosen to try to shut them all down again, to use my will. Now, at, up to that point, I only had faith in the error. The error being, something's wrong with me, I'm going to go crazy if I allow these feelings to continue or if I allow myself to process them, something bad is going to happen. I actually believed with all my heart that I would die by the time I was 33. That's been with me all my life, that feeling that I was going to die when I was 33. And, and I, I tried to avoid that too, <laughs> just like I tried to avoid everything else. I used my will to tell myself that it's crazy. There's, you know, I only had faith in the error. That's all I had. Right? I had no desire to find out the truth about any of it. Now, because of that, I eventually got myself into such a position that I was alone. Everyone that I knew would not speak to me. I was completely alone financially, emotionally, physically, and, and everything. And, and eventually I had to come face to face with their feelings. You see, God's always drawing you into a state of truth. God's always trying to get you to face some facts about your life, right? And this is the case with many of you. God's trying to draw you into facing some facts about your life. And if you process through them emotionally without needing to involve anyone else, you will get to the facts of, the, of it emotionally. If you are honest about your addiction. So I firstly had to go through my addiction and be honest about them. I, I wasn't addicted to having everybody know me. I've never had an addiction for approval. I've never had an addiction to having glory or any of those kind of things. So that's not, that none of those, in fact, I was totally terrified of everybody knowing me. And in a lot of ways, as Mary knows, I still am. <laughs> um, and that's something that I'm still working through even now. I'm still working through some of that uh, emotion. But I had to come face to face with this error that, that if I process something emotionally, that it would mean that I'd go crazy. Now, many of you have yet to actually go through that truth. You still believe that if you process something emotionally, you'll go crazy and you'll end up in an asylum. Right? Many of you feel that. It's something I had to work my way through and allow myself to feel as an emotion. I had to come to accept the truth from God's perspective that emotions would lead me to truth if I allowed myself to feel them properly. If I allowed myself to feel them without any addiction, I would get there in the end. So I had to come to trust that if I did things God's way, it would all work out in the end. Because to be honest with you, I never had any faith in that. I never had any faith that if I did something God's way, it would work out in the end. The way I felt before then was if I did something God's way, it would just, re it would just result in the annihilation of my own life. Right? That's how I felt. And it took me quite some time, seven years nearly, of different types of emotional processing to come to the soul-based realisation that if I do things God's way, it would always work out the best. Right. You want to give an example for yourself? Sure. I'll give a, an example, a recent one in my life. Um, I, to give a bit of background, the last six months for me has really been about reflecting on God's laws and how do I have any honour or faith in God's laws? I, um, I say that I really believe in them and I 
I feel passionately about them, but is that real in my life and the way I'm living my life? Now, when I met AJ, I'll call him AJ because this is what we are in this incarnation. Um, so when I met him again, to also give some background, I was someone who was, I was never a very popular kid in school or high school. And when I went to university, I really got into this addiction of wanting people to like me. I always had the feeling that I wanted people to like me. But I really started to mould myself and meld myself in ways so that I felt that people would approve of me and I would be a worldly person. Because I was always very scared of the world. And when we met, I suddenly felt that the last decade or so was going to be wasted because I was suddenly going to lose everyone's approval. And I did. And my own family said, look, we're afraid for you, you're probably going to die early, something terrible is going to happen, the rest of your life you will be ostracised and it will be horrible. So that was a lot of my fears being reflected to me. And um, I kind of lived in that feeling, that I had faith in that feeling. That was actually, true. that that was true, that my life actually, I couldn't deny it, this truth was so attractive, I was doing the tag team thing, but actually, I had to accept the truth that life was pretty much a fringe dweller, I was going to be a fringe dweller from here on out. And um, even though this is the most amazing, life-changing truth you could ever hear, and my heart is dying for everyone to hear it, I'm probably not going to share it that much or that vocally or be myself very much because it's all just going to end in me being ostracised. And frankly, you know, I, no matter what you say about all the other laws, I'm the exception because I'm Mary Magdalene. <laughs> and then about three years ago, the media approached us and they wanted to do a story on us and you, lots of you were here and they came and um, it was sort of the first time and it started out, David Milliken came and he wanted to just write a section in a book he was writing about us and I was even freaked out about that and within a couple of months he, was, he wanted to do a TV segment about us. Now my approach to that was I wasn't honouring any of God's laws basically. I, wanted, I modified my will, I modified who I was. I wanted to present a, pre present a facade to him and I wanted him to like me. I wanted him to see I'm just a nice, regular girl, you know, and it really we're just, I, it didn't matter. I just wanted to be whatever he thought would be a, an acceptable person. And in that, I was not only modifying my own will, I was trying to control his will. I was trying to control the outcome of what was going to happen. I wasn't saying that, but my soul-based feeling was, I want things to go this way. All the while having faith in the error that it's probably all going to end badly anyway. Guess what happened? You don't have to guess, you saw it. <laughs> um, so after that, I thought, yep, there you go, there's my evidence. I had faith in the error and I got some evidence to support it and you'd be surprised at how often that happens in your own life. You live with an error, you have faith in that error, and then you do, you act in accordance with that error, and then you go, yep, and there's my evidence. There's my evidence that all of this stuff about God's laws and divine truth, well, it doesn't really shape up in every situation. Let's face it. So beyond this point, now my tack changed. <laughs> I decided... For the next few media interactions that we had, and we didn't have many after that, oh, we had a, a sort of a rash of them, and then... Well, there, to be honest, you didn't want any, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want any. That was it. No more media for me. Yeah. I didn't want any to start with, and then that was proof we should never, ever talk to the media again. And then, so, Jesus did a few more TV things, and, um, and then it, it went quiet for a year or so. And then we decided, look, there was so much error presented about us that the most loving thing to do for truth is to record what happens with the media. So we're going to just record whatever they do and put it on our YouTube site, and that's our condition. Now, of course, this began to challenge the feelings that I had of wanting to please everyone who I perceive has power. And I I'm so afraid of the media, I perceive they have a lot of power. So... Now another emotion is being triggered for me. No, we have to please these people. We can't be putting stipulations on them. If we put stipulations, it'll go even worse. That was what my fear was telling me. So, but I begrudgingly thought, it's true though, so okay, we'll do it. 
And the feeling inside of me was not an embracing of my will. It wasn't a feeling I'm allowed to choose what happens in my life. My feeling was, if I'm afraid, I have to do what the fear says, and I'm afraid they're going to think we're picky and weird and doing this, and so we should not do this. That was the soul-based feeling. So notice already in my life, there's all these soul-based feelings I'm not even being humble to. I'm just like doing what I think I should do, begrudgingly having faith in a lot of error. And then things didn't go that well either. So not, it's willing, but only willing when you're forced. <laughs> Willing when the truth is kind of nagging me, um, but it's not this, these lovely feelings we talked about of desirous. I wasn't desirous of doing this because my faith was in error. My faith was, yeah, truth works and, you know, the law of attraction does bring you things and there is such a thing as cause and effect. But when it comes to being Mary Magdalene with the media, no. <laughs> that was really what I felt, quite honestly. So then, um, more recently, what I would do is I would just go away emotionally. I wasn't there. So all these media people who came to see us, they were like, what's going on with her? She just doesn't even really look that good, does she? You know, <laughs> she's not really happy, is she? Not understanding that and my... she wasn't happy every time they, uh, yes. one member of the media came, of there course. There was a <laughs> cause and effect in terms of the media entered. I wasn't very happy. Um, so but... being there, isn't there? <laughs> What are they going to do to me now? Yeah, it's all going to go... This is the feeling coming out of me. Right, right, I can feel you judging us, whatever. So, you know, I wasn't being very humble, was I? I wasn't being very humble. And I also wasn't being myself, which is really being humble. It got, it got to the point where I said to Mary that, actually, if I'm going to have a media interaction, you need to not be around. And I was like, good, okay. <laughs> I don't even want to be around them. And I said that because, because actually I felt... There were more negative spirit influences upon Mary and others who were with us doing the filming than there were upon the person who was the media person trying to do the interview. <laughs> and actually, that yes, yes. So uh, this, is, this is the state I was in, kind of not even really wanting to be aware of all this, you know, bound up stuff. I love God and God's laws and I love divine truth and I love our life, but when it comes to the media, no. I don't even want to be humble to what's going on inside of me. <laughs> Just a, it's a special case scenario um, because there's so much fear in me. We've all got special case scenarios, right? <laughs> and when the last group of media came, uh, approached us, so this was quite a few months ago now, actually, we started liaising with the guys in New Zealand back in December. And I was the person, I was the point of contact on purpose because I realised that my approach and my agenda and my faith had been in very negative things. And I thought, hang on, if I'm going to honour God's laws, my soulmate's given me a lot of truth about how I'm actually behaving, what would it look like if I honoured God's laws in this situation? What would it look like if I was humble, if I acknowledged I had my own will, and that I acknowledged that I was attracting this because God thought I was ready? I didn't, but God must. And we had many discussions, didn't we, about um, how I see interactions compared to how Mary saw them. And, and we also had many inter, inter discussions about how I could feel this as a big wall between myself and Mary as well. Because every time your partner or your soulmate has a, has a different opinion to you on something, it's, a, it's like a wall between, between the two of you. Now, I don't mind if somebody has a different opinion to me, but when the opinion is out of harmony with God's truth, I can't accept it, no matter what, <laughs> who, who has it, right? So, so the problem is, that I, I felt like I was being drawn more and more into the acceptance of God's truth about these issues, and more and more Mary was opposing it. And there, and there was an active opposition in Mary towards where God was leading our soul. And so we had to have quite a number of conversations about that and how much that was actually blocking any flow between us as well. Right. Yeah, and I would have to say that is probably the issue, that this is what caused me to behave differently. <laughs> it wasn't actually that I thought, yeah, media, rock on, let's embrace this. I went, you know what, this is causing so much pain in my life in terms of my connection with God and my connection with my soulmate, I have to do something differently. And I have to start accepting some truth. 
And that is, hey, I am living this life. I am here. I am, to I am saying I'm Mary Magdalene. And unless I think I'm going to change that, which I don't, maybe you're going to have to face facts and reality. It's a truth. It's not going to go away. What you think the media is just going to go, oh, well, forget those guys. Especially as, you know, more and more people start listening, which I believe will happen. Um, so I had to face the fact that this is an issue that's not going to go away and it's causing pain in my life. So I started liaising with the guys in New Zealand and the first emotion that I had to work through was this feeling that I'm not allowed to say what happens. Now, this is about my will. I didn't, I, my will can is... I, can I just say, I'm saying to Mary at this point, whose life is it that they want to interview? <laughs> like, it's yours, isn't it? So how can you then say, from a logical perspective, that you're not going to say what happens. It's your life. You're allowed to say exactly what happens. If they, if they have to jump over some hoops and jump around some tyres and go over a bar and everything just to interview you, then that's what's going to have to happen to interview you. You're allowed to say what the person has to do. Yeah, and this is, this is a part of me that is not well developed, my understanding of my own will. I feel that if I make anyone uncomfortable, I must modify my will. And so this, I really had to like process because I'm the person liaising with these guys and it, it did take six months for them to arrive here or nearly six, four or five months. And I feel strongly it was because I was working through these emotions. We kind of went through a bit of uh, interaction and I had to feel this yucky feeling I felt of almost guilt of just saying what I know we're going to have to record you and this is the stipulation. So I worked through some of that emotion, but I still didn't think that I would be involved in the filming. I made no promises that I would be involved in the filming. And this was also a really good step for me. Because in the past, I have always thought, well, you know what, it's the right thing to do. What, it's just going to be Jesus saying he's Jesus. And how unsupportive of that, you know, am I if I just sort of sit back and go, you know what, I'm just too afraid to do it. Um, so I just forced myself because it was the right thing to do. This is also not embracing my own will. This is begrudging, and I see you guys do this about things. And it's not actual soul progress. I maybe did deal with some fear. I dealt with enough emotion to realise emotionally what I'm talking about now, but it really wasn't very productive. I could have faced the truth about what was happening inside of me a lot earlier and been more honest. Because I realised that based on God's laws and based on spirit attraction, if I went into this new interaction with the same emotions that I had in the previous ones, I was only going to attract negative spirits. And could I really say then that if it all turned out negatively that it was just based on how corrupt the media is? Or maybe it has something to do with me and what I attract and the causes are something to do with my soul. Mm. So... This is a long story, isn't it? I didn't think it was going to be this long. <laughs> but anyway, we, we get to like a couple of weeks before these guys are arriving and I'm still deciding if I'm in the right, right space. But this is beautiful for me because for the first time maybe in my life I feel like I have a choice. It's most loving if I'm in a crappy space to not participate and I, it's okay if I say I'm not going to participate. This is me starting to understand the truth about my will. And also, I began to see, as I did those things and was more humble to the emotions that it was bringing up, and we had some beautiful discussions, about having faith in error and how much I just believed that it was going to go badly and what were the emotions that were driving this feeling. And I actually had some big cries about feeling disillusioned and that it was all going to be terrible. And, and we also had some discussions, didn't we, about how you wanted to, it to, to feel that it was all going to be terrible before it began. And that way you could justify not doing it in the first place. I had an investment in this sense? belief. It was helping me avoid fear. Yeah. So right before they came, I realised, OK, I can do this. If I do it, though, I have to not try and control anything apart from just be myself. And I realised, ethically, this is the most loving thing to do. If I be myself and just, here I am, this is who I am, this is my experience, don't try to analyse what they're going to do with it, because actually, that's, that's an expression of their free will, and they're allowed to do whatever they want with it. And if I have any angst about it, there's an error in me. And I realised I could go into this interaction 
One, choosing it. And also, two, choosing to say, no, I don't want to do that. No, I don't want to answer that question. No, I don't want to be filmed in that way. I'd never had that feeling before either. I always felt they're powerful because I'm afraid and I should do what they want. And suddenly I had this new feeling that actually, no, I can just be myself and I can say yes or no to being there. Or, and when I'm there, I can say yes or no to answering a question or doing what they want. This was awesome. <laughs> And I began, because I'm processing through this, to realise how much faith I had in error and new truth started to be exposed to me. We had the first interaction with the guys from New Zealand and that was it. I was just me. I didn't, there was no facade. I was just there. Here I am. This is who I am. And actually, just because everyone else thinks I'm a freak, I'm not a freak and I'm not going to act like I'm trying to control how you think I might be freaky or not. You know, I'm just me and this is who I am. And I had so much fun. It was great. I liked those guys, you know. We got to have some good chats and it was a lovely, lovely... I haven't watched... Mary was there sitting in her Crocs and her slippers. Oh, and, uh, oh yeah. Can, can I tell that part of the story too? Because it, it is a long story now. Um, but... <laughs> I can't say I'm completely healed of these emotions, obviously. And so on the day they were coming, I was still had a lot of fear coming, like going on in my body. And I, could not, I couldn't figure out what to wear at all because it was freezing and we're going to be outside. And I didn't realise, but I'd left half my clothes in the Kyabra packing. And so I was like, wow, I don't have any winter clothes. What am I going to wear? Blah, blah, blah. Fear, fear, fear. Anyway, in the end, I found something. Rushed outside, but I didn't have anything on my feet, so I just pulled my bed socks on and AJ's old Crocs from, the so from beside the front door and sat down. And here I am being myself, but there's still fear in me because I said, you're not going to film my feet, are you? Because, like, <laughs> you know, this is not really working with the outfit. Um, <laughs> and they said, no, 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 it's all close up. Okay, okay, good. But... I love, I, and this was just such a beautiful, beautiful lesson for me about how much my soul is in play in these interactions. Because what happened during the filming was um, the producer took a couple of snaps and right at the end, Igor took a snap of us all together. What's in that photo? Bed socks and Crocs. What went up on the internet I found out later? Mary in bed socks and Crocs. And then people commenting on the Crocs. And I was like, wow, this is so tailor-made, you know. <laughs> people can see exactly my hole and they are triggering it. So uh, that was really powerful, like silly, goofy lesson of reinforcing to me that, hey, God's laws are really... Wor like, I was thinking my soul had no power in this situation. That The law of attraction, really, essentially, my faith was... It doesn't matter who I am, what I do, how I feel. This situation is going to end this way, in, an, in a bad way. And I be, in this whole experience, I began to see, no, it's really different to that. If I'm humble, if I, use, if I embrace my will, not in a negative way, trying to control everything, but just to be myself, really amazing things can start to happen. And the truth of it, I thought the truth was the media is corrupt and we'll always be freaks forever. Now, that might be true. <laughs> I'm not sure yet. But the real truth, God's truth is, if I embrace this lesson, this situation with humility, I will grow no matter what else happens. And that is so powerful that I will grow if I honour these, if I honour God's laws, if I use my will in harmony with love, if I'm humble, if I'm truthful and loving, then I will grow. I will have more capacity to love, more capacity to be close to my soulmate and to God. And that's what happened. Now that is having faith in a truth. Whereas before, all I could see was the error and I acted, I used my will according to that error. And since then, there's like been an explosion of media. And I'm still not without fear. I'm still going, oh. People want to put us on live daytime television, prime time television in England. And I'm thinking about, what am I going to wear? <laughs> not the Crocs. 
No, I'm freaking out more <laughs> about what am I, how, how am I going to be myself in a situation where I can feel so many people are watching me. But, um, but I certainly have faith that if I go into it with humility, you know what, it doesn't really matter if 20 million people think she's a bit flaky, if I've grown. And that's the truth. So I hope that story fitted with the lesson. <laughs> 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 you see, the, the error, the faith in the error causes the exercise of your will towards the error. It causes you to think the truth is the error, and it causes you to not be humble to more truth. And as a result, in the end, you're just going to be feeding addictions, feeding, you know, feeding all the things that in the end are not going to get you any closer to God. So so the problem that we face is looking at all of the areas of our life where we believe the error is true. And That's we act we according to that. You know, we don't challenge that with truth. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the biggest area where... The, the reason why we've talked about this with faith and prayer is because the biggest area in your life that is affected by this problem is the issue of prayer. You will not pray while you have faith in errors about God. You won't be able to generate the appropriate soul-based feelings about God or about yourself in order to pray. So, for example, many of you have faith in the belief that you are a bad person. Now, that prevents a flow of love between yourself and God. Because you think you're a bad person, you stop people's love from entering you. You stop God's love from entering you. That's a faith in an error that needs to go if you're ever going to ever even receive love from God. So it needs to be confronted. The error needs to be confronted rather than just believed. Some of you believe that you are better than other people. Some of you have that belief. It's evident in your day-to-day -day life and how you treat other people. You will have to confront that belief, that faith in the error. You're not better than other people from God's perspective. You're the same as other people from God's perspective. Right? You'll have to confront that error and have faith in a different truth if you're ever going to actually receive love from God and you're ever going to demonstrate love towards your neighbour. Right? Could we give some background on how we started to um, talk about these five aspects in relation to prayer, babe? Because it's actually something that you talked to me about, wasn't it, a little while ago? Yeah, would you like to y Yeah, you have for me to yeah. do that? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the other day, I had a bit of a meltdown, and I realised that... Um, as Mary does sometimes. As I do. And you'll get to see it on camera because we were filming a pageant message discussion. But anyway. Um, <laughs> um, we were talking about receiving God's love and acting in harmony with God's love. And I was, I was saying, look, if you just ask for the love, it changes everything, you know? I feel like it makes you more sensitive and I, I feel like if... It, basically, the feeling that was inside of me during the discussion that was making me tense and then melt down was the feeling like, if only five years ago I'd just asked for the love the way I ask for the love now, everything would have happened differently, you know? And I feel like, ugh, with myself that I didn't because, like I said to you earlier, I feel ashamed about a lot of the things that I did and when I lacked humility and all of these kinds of things. And I and said to Mary... It's not true. Because five years ago, you were in a very different place. Five years ago, when I met you, you had very little humility. You had very little desire for truth. You were exercising your will you had f and faith in a direction of error almost constantly. And all of those things had to be addressed before you would actually long for God's love. Because I, I don't, I f have received a lot of God's love in my 2,000 years of life, a lot. Um, but in the last five years, in the last 35, 34, 35 years, I haven't received that much, guys. 
you know, and I, I see that a, there's a lot of um, focus in everyone of like trying to get it right and trying to, oh, you know, it's all, and this is why sometimes you panic when new truth's presented and you're like, hang on, let me control the flow of truth here, explain it to me a bit more, rather than just allowing that, that panicky feeling. Um, because I feel like everyone's trying to meet the bar and get it right or, or think they've already got it when actually the truth being presented is confronting the fact that they haven't already got it. So I said to my dear soulmate, who is so patient and kind when I have meltdowns, <laughs> well, what happened, you know? Now I feel like I can long and I receive God's love every time. But, you know, I didn't ask. I didn't ask for four years. I just didn't ask. Um, what was that about? <laughs> and how did I get to this point where suddenly I feel like I can ask and receive? And he said to me, <laughs> well, you weren't really looking at those other aspects within you that, that, caused, that were causing you to be so shut down. And really, when we talk about prayer, we have to talk about these things, don't we? The mm -hmm. loving use of our will for truth and humility. Yeah, yeah. I, I, like there is a direct relation. Obviously, we are capable of praying right from the time we hear about God and that God has love to give us. We're capable of doing it. But the problem for most of us is that we try it once or twice or whatever and, and it doesn't seem to work. So, so we then think, well, either what AJ is saying to us is not true or maybe it's true but it's only true for certain people <laughs> or maybe it's true but, um, you know, he hasn't given us all the details and, uh, and it's all his fault that it's not, not happening. Um, and we very... Or I have to just deal with all of my mum and dad's stuff. And, and then it, it might start happening. Or, oh, actually, maybe this little feeling, maybe that was God's love. Um, the feelings that you get from spirits. Maybe they were God's love, right? We often tell ourselves that. And many of you are doing that too. You're telling yourself that the love that you are receive or have been receiving is from God, but it's only been from spirits feeding your addictions. So we, we, we have a tendency to do all of these justifications. And then what we finish up doing is we, after these justifications occur, we have this tendency to go either to give up or to just feel that it's all just a rubbish anyway, or we go into this place of self-attack, you know, where you're saying there must be something wrong with me, maybe I am, you know, like the prayer says that I am the pinnacle of God's creation but I feel like I'm the dregs of God's creation and maybe that's what the problem is and, and we go through lots of different issues right we we have a tendency to feel about some of these issues but we also have a tendency to deny the feelings about those issues now as a result we have yet to learn humility we have very little desire or passion for truth we have yet to exercise our will in harmony with love even with our, in harmony with love of ourselves let alone love of anyone else and we have faith in the error. Now, that's, that's the place we start. That's the position we're in when we start this process. We have these qualities that are all undeveloped in us. They are all, all, all misapplied. They're all going somewhere in some direction that's out of harmony with the truth of those, the, the proper exercise of these particular qualities. As a result of those qualities being exercised out of harmony with love, out of harmony with truth, what, and our will uh, also being exercised in the same direction, and our faith in the error being present, we are going to have to go through a series of experiences that correct that position before we receive love. Right? So, for example, you cannot receive love if you believe God does not exist at all. You can receive love if you believe that God might exist. Right? But if you actually feel in your heart that God doesn't exist at all and you're not going to let go of that position, no matter what, you will not receive God's love. It's as simple as that. But if you're willing to accept that there is the potential that God exists and ask for love under those circumstances, you can receive God's love 
In other words, you're willing to experiment. One is having faith in an error. The error being, God does not exist. And the faith being, I believe with all my heart, God does not exist. The other is having faith in a truth, or at least allowing the potential of such a truth to exist. And that allows an opening of your soul. And therefore, something can flow. And this is what we do with most of these qualities. We, we, we do not develop them. But if we say, if we're honest with ourselves, the majority of us want love. Is that not true? The majority of us want love. If we're honest with ourselves, the majority of us do want love. We have some misgivings about it, many of us, like we're worried that it might control us. Or we're worried that the person who loves us might want to control us and so forth, which are all the misgivings we have. But in the end, a lot of the times we do want some love. That is the quality that we want. So let's just circle that quality. But we are unwilling to develop the qualities required to receive it. Does that make sense to you? In other words, we're unwilling to shift our faith away from the error, right? Or we are unwilling to use our will in harmony with the love that we've already received. In other words, we receive a little bit of love, and then that, that love tells us that we've got to go to our partner and tell him the truth that five years ago I cheated on her or, her or him. And we feel unwilling. We don't want to do that. It's going to create a mess. It, it might break up our relationship. You know, it happened five years ago anyway. You know, it's all past, dead and buried now. You know, the other person that we cheated on our partner with has gone on their merry way. And, you know, it's all over now anyway. We might tell ourselves all these stories, right? Right? In other words, we're not using our will in harmony with love or truth. We're not being humble to what will happen if we just fully disclose our life to, to even our partner. So the majority of us, what we do is we want the love, but we're unwilling to do the rest of the things required in order to continuously receive it. Right? And that's our problem. That's why we don't receive much of it. And that's why we don't grow. So one way, one way to, work, to work out whether this has been happening in your life is to look at your personality and character five years ago, if it's been five years since you've since you heard about receiving love, look at your personality and character now, right at this point in time, right now, and compare your personality and character and how you, inter how you relate to other people, how you relate to your children, how you relate to your partner, how your relationship with God is, and be honest with yourself, what do you find? Now, a person who has started to develop these qualities will always find that there was growth. A person who has not really developed much in these qualities will find that really, substantially, they are much the same person that they were five years ago in the way they feel inside of themselves and the way that they relate to other people. And in particular, the way they think about and feel about God. Now, if you're honest with yourself about that, if you compare, you make this comparison between those two points, and so you do the compare, the comparison, not for self-criticism or self-judgment, but just for a point of honesty, just to do it, because you need to see the truth about whether you've changed, right? And if there has been little or no change in, the true, in your true character and nature and the way in which you interact with others, then I suggest to you, you've heard a lot of truth, but you've applied very little of it. And the main reason why you've applied very little of it because of, is because of these five main qualities that need to be developed. You're not wanting to develop one or more of them. Right. Now, we can't expect to pray and receive love while we refuse to develop certain aspects of our nature which are a part of the qualities of love. We can't expect to continuously do that. So there are conditions under which 
we cannot receive divine love. Now, most of us don't even want to believe that. We want to believe that if we ask for love, we'll always get it no matter what. Right? We want to believe even that when we ask that we're even being sincere. What I'm saying to you is when we have a sincere, pure desire to feel love enter our soul, we will receive it. But it has to be a sincere, pure desire to do it. And if we're unwilling to develop these qualities, how can we say we have a sincere, pure desire to do it, to receive that love? We can't. So we might think we do, but we don't. And we need to change that and be more realistic with ourselves. And this is a part of the science of prayer. There are conditions under which communication with God, which remember yesterday, last night, we suggested was a flow of love between God and ourselves. There are, there are times when that cannot happen because of how we have exercised our will. Your will is more powerful than God's love. Now that didn't go down well. <laughs> now I'm not saying that from a power perspective it's more powerful. What I'm saying is the way God constructed your soul is this. He gave you the ability to choose what enters it. And he gave you this ability and this ability is within you, you can reject anything from entering it. This also means that you can personally reject God's love from entering your soul. In that way, your soul is more powerful than God's love as respects to your soul. Not as respects to the rest of the universe. God's love is much more powerful there than your soul is. But as respects your own individual soul... What you have enter it and what you have exit your soul is completely under your personal control. Your soul's personal control. God himself will not force anything to enter you. God will not manipulate your will. Many of you say, I'm afraid that if I receive God's love that I'll have to do what God wants me to do. No, God's not like that. God will not even manipulate your will to do anything, even after you've received the love. Right? And the reality is you will not receive love unless your soul is open to its reception. In other words, you have complete control over whether God's love enters you or not. No one else has control over that. Even God does not have control over that. You're the person with control over it. Right? And every time you think you're longing for God's love and don't feel it and don't feel it enter you, it's because your soul is exercising its control. Not because of any other reason. There's no magical thing going on from God's perspective. God's not going, yes, I don't think I will give her love right at this moment. Because I just don't feel like it. Right? There is always control being exercised by your own soul over the experience of love flowing into your soul. In this regard, you must understand one of the primary sciences of prayer. Remember, true prayer opens the hole to allow... It opens the soul... It opens, remember I drew yesterday a circle and I said, it, it, imagine that's your soul. It creates an opening in your soul so that love can flow in. That's what prayer does. Prayer will also automatically, as a result of it, it and its nature, open any hole in your soul to allow any error to flow out. That's humility. Prayer True prayer creates more humility. It is one of the sciences of prayer. Right? True prayer does that. So if it hasn't been happening, then it, then it hasn't been true prayer. It's only been just an intellectual concept of prayer. Does that make sense? Yeah, could I ask a clarifier? Yeah. yeah. So 
these five qualities that you, that you've raised these with ones us here, this yeah? morning. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just get out of your way so uh, okay. you can talk about. It. All right. Yeah. Um, if if we acknowledge that these five qualities are somehow related to prayer, they they form. Are they part of this building on each other? process or are they prerequisites for actual opening of the soul to, to a sincere longing? Um, I would not see I would not call them prerequisites so much as aspects or qualities that are required for it to happen. Um, prerequisites sort of suggest that you've got to do it before you receive anything. What I'm suggesting is you have to do this as you're receiving it. Not before, but as in the moment of reception, this has to be the case. So if in the moment of your desire for God's love, you also have no exercise of your will in any positive direction towards love, then of course the in it's going to be your intellect praying, it's not going to be your soul having a feeling of desire for God's love. Right? Do you, do you understand the difference? I sort of feel as adults we're very afraid of the sensation of longing most of us as children have experienced a feeling of longing and often been disappointed or, or something's happened and we shut down this very uh, emotional and opening sensation of longing. Can I and, just say, yeah. do you remember when you were a kid and you wanted a lolly uh, of candy or you know, a, a lolly bar or something that was your favourite you know, one? Do, do you remember that no really wasn't an option from your parents. you remember that? <laughs> there was just this, oh, I want to, and, and, it's, and you can't, and they say, shut up or I'll belt you, and you still can't shut up, because you're, <laughs> you're still... And you're thinking about it, you can almost taste it. it. You, it's, like, it's like your focal point. Yeah. All, all of your desires are focused on it so much that you can't even stop yourself from doing it, even when you're threatened with violence. Do, do, do you notice that? When you're a child, now you have to be threatened with violence and it carried out a number of times before you'd probably shut up. Right? That, that's, the, that, that's how strong the, the suppression of your will had to be before you started suppressing your own desire. And what I'm suggesting to you is that's the kind of, that's the kind of desire that needs to be involved in prayer. Exactly that. And this is where I feel like we can't kid ourselves sometimes when we say, yeah, I'm praying, when there's not a really heart-opening process involved. You know, that's, that's what true prayer is, a very, very sincere opening thing, which is why I asked the question about the five qualities, because I can't discern where they fit together. I can't seem to pray unless I feel... or I, I desire to pray and then I'm these things or I'm these things and then I'm praying. Or, but they all seem to be together inside of me. Um, but the difference is that you can't actively use these things out of harmony with love and expect to receive love. So you can't actively be proud or arrogant and expect to receive love. You can't actively believe in the error and expect to receive love. You can't actively use your will out of harmony with love and expect to receive more love. You can't actively have faith in an error and expect to receive more love. So we need to soften to these things in order to receive. And these things are all going to assist us to receive, in fact. And yeah. what I suggested to Mary was, you don't have to worry about your addictions, you don't have to worry about your fears, you don't have to worry about anything else other than these five qualities for the rest of your life. Really. And, uh, yeah. You don't have to worry about working out whether you did the right thing, the wrong thing, whether you're making a mistake, whether you should do an experiment, don't do experiment. You know all the intellectual gymnastics that you've been doing? I, I don't do it. Right? All I worry about are those five things. Every single decision that I'm faced with at every single moment, all I ask myself is about those five things. That's it. And I do it whether I want to do it or not. Because I know if I don't want to do it, I'll be triggered into some kind of emotion that will show or expose to me the reason why I didn't want to do it. 
Right? So if I don't want to use my will in harmony with love, I sit there and go, wow, I don't want to use my will in harmony with love now, right now. I, will, I just want to close down and stop, stop being open. You know, that's my, my use of my will out of harmony with love. Wow, there's something going on here for me. Right? Admit the truth to myself about those five qualities and there's a very high likelihood you will never be stagnant for the rest of your life. You'll continuously grow. So in the front of my journal now, I have written, are my actions humble, in harmony with God's truth, faithful to truthful things rather than erroneous things, and in harmony with love? If my actions are arrogant or resistive, are avoiding a truth, if they have faith in error-based things, and if they are unloving, then I cannot grow. And I am using my will actively to be in disharmony with all of God's universal laws. Which is a lot simpler than trying to analyse what addiction and like... Because the addictions get exposed in me so rapidly now, yeah. If you focus on developing those five qualities from a pure, sincere perspective, you will find every addiction will be confronted. Everyone. The whole reason why we don't do it is because we don't want our addictions confronted. Uh, if you think about how many opportunities you've had to tell the truth about your personal life in the time that you've known me, and yet you've not even told the truth about your personal life to your own partner... Right, then you'd go, well, obviously I don't have much of a, a love for truth. I haven't developed that yet. Obviously I'm not humble to what might happen, to what might occur when I tell them the actual truth of my, how I feel. I'm not humble to the results. So that I don't want to be either. Be, be honest. And then ask yourself, would you like your future to be different? Because if you would like your future to be different, you're going to have to develop these qualities. <laughs> You, it'll be forced upon you, right? It'll be forced upon you because, not because of uh, any, you know, somebody else forcing it upon you, but because without developing these qualities, no change will actually take place to your soul. And if you want to change, these qualities have to be developed. It's as simple as that. So I'm not telling you what you have to do to develop them, I'm just saying they have to be developed if you want to change. And if you want to have a relationship with God at any point in time in the future to the point of alignment with God, these qualities must change. And that, they must grow. Yeah, it's the growth in those qualities. What I got from our discussion, because often I'm so involved in a process and change happens and I, I can't really understand exactly what's happened because it's all been so emotional. But what I, what I can now see from the discussion that we had is that... Remember earlier I said I was the rock when we met five years ago? There wasn't just one blocked emotion. It was like total soul constipation. <laughs> Mary said it was... We were driving the car this morning. She Go said... She, she doesn't want me to repeat this, yeah. but I will. She said it was like stools of constipation <laughs> popping out of her. <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful imagery. <laughs> Probably not that I want you to be having about me, but anyway. Um, it was all very blocked up, my soul. And it, and it has been the developing of those qualities that has softened me enough in order to have a longing. And so it doesn't have to take you five years. It just took me that long. Um, but really focusing on those qualities, which I didn't realise that's what I was doing. But at every turn, really, I was developing humility, wanting, more and more desiring to face truth, especially about myself. And finally, the last thing, and, and the issues of faith and love, but really this idea of that I have a will, that's something that was very... I, I, my will was to please others that's, and to get their approval was really what, how I was using my will. And really coming to understand the pain of that and how, much that, how little that meant I was actually expressing my own self and my own will. I think that was the final like, missing link to me actually then being longing, really longing to God, using my will uh, in harmony with those things to ask for God's love, to further refine me with that love. 
So one of the things that I have mentioned all the way through this is this error and fear-based thing. So let's just remind you of that before we go to our break. It's our desire to stay in that state of fear that causes the lack of development of every single one of these qualities. So Mary, like with Mary, I've just simplified it right down to one thing. I've said that all of these qualities will naturally develop as you receive love. So as you receive love, there will be a development of these qualities because in the moment of receiving love, one of these qualities has to be developed. One or more, and usually all of them, has to be developed to receive love. And they would all confront fear. And if you're unwilling... So unwilling to feel it, or even, can we say, better than that, if you do not desire to feel your fear, if you have no desire to feel the fear that you have within you, then at some point the fear will influence every single one of these qualities. Remember how I said I didn't ask for love for four years? That's because I knew <laughs> that I would ask for love and it would confront every one of my fears, just the asking. Um, I, I guess I knew that from a soul perspective, being mm -hmm. who I am. Mm -hmm. But um, certainly starting to ask confronts fear in all of those areas. So if you believe you are looking or seeking divine love and you think you're praying, and you know you're not receiving it, or it feels like you're not receiving it, there's only really one question you have to ask yourself. What am I afraid of? Right now, what am I afraid of? That's the only question you have to ask yourself. Because you will always be afraid of something. <laughs> That's the only thing that is governing how, what's happening. It'll be the way you're using your will. Like you're afraid to use your will in a positive direction. You, or you, you are afraid of changing your belief systems. You want to believe in the error. You're afraid of believing in the truth. You want to believe in the error. Or you want the truth to be error, even. Or you don't want to be humble. You don't want to feel. You don't want to have to feel the emotion that is really there. The one, not the ones that you would like to be there. You know, all the ones that tell you that you're a nice, kind, lovely person. You know those ones, those emotions? You like feeling those ones. But what are, and all the ones that tell you that mum and dad, they were the persons who did all the damage to you. You want to feel all those emotions, right? But you don't want to feel all the emotions where, that are there because of the exercise of your own will out of harmony with love. The things that tell you that you've actually been a crappy person in your life at times, where you've done a lot of damage to other people and you've harmed them and you chose to do it. You chose to do it even when you had a different choice. You chose to do it. You don't want to feel those emotions, right? That's the lack of humility. These are the kind of things that are present that will stop prayer from having any, well, it, it won't even happen. Prayer won't even happen with those emotions. Because to pray, there has to be that sincere flow of love between you and God. That's the way God communicates with you. But the beauty, isn't it, is it when we have the courage to pray like that, with humility and desiring truth and really wanting to face fear... It becomes, then suddenly God can enter the picture and it helps us so much and we, we begin to develop those qualities exponentially, don't we? Mm. Suddenly mm. humility is growing and we're feeling the benefits of it and we're starting to feel how loving truth is and how, how much power it gives us to change and we start mm. to welcome those things, don't we? Yeah. It's, it's like a um, We need to... Basically, effect. it's cutting out the fear from being our God and then making God our God, and the development of these qualities our primary concern. Right? For the majority yeah. of us, fear is our God, and the development of these qualities is immaterial. They're immaterial because we only develop them when it doesn't interfere with our fear. 
Can you see how that was the case with my story with the media? In that scenario, fear was my God, and I was just under that dictate, and that was what was ruling and governing that situation for me. And essentially, it governed a lot of the outcomes. Um, and then when I said, hang on, what's God's truth about this situation? How can I be in harmony with God's laws in this situation? A whole other reality started to happen for me. And that's because fear was no longer my God. I went, hang on, actually God's more powerful than everything in this situation. What does God feel about this situation? How can I be more in harmony with that? And surprise, surprise, things got better. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, let's have a break, shall we? And... Uh... When we come back, we'll talk more about the science of prayer. Good.